Hello, my name is Tony Morbin, Executive News Editor at ISMG, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar, Who is Faking Location? How are fraudsters using location spoofing to attack location-based apps? Our subject matter experts today are Andre Faraz, CEO and founder, Incognia, and Philippe Sequeira, Global Head of Operations, RAPI. But before I introduce our speakers, just a bit of background on today's session. Incognio has recently published an insights report on novel fraud schemes using location spoofing to target delivery apps. So why is location spoofing so important? Fraudsters spoof their location to take advantage of location-based services to swindle trusted users, food delivery companies, restaurants, gamers, and even people looking for a date. Location-based apps rely on location data shared by users to deliver important aspects of their service, such as informing users of driver availability based on user location, or showing potential dates close by, or notifying when a food delivery is on its way. Before we begin, for those of you unfamiliar with Information Security Media Group, we are a global education and intelligence firm with 30 plus international media sites in vertical sectors such as bank info security, Gov Info Security and Health Info Security, with more than 950,000 members registered to our sites. We've created an intelligence source tackling the key issues of interest to information security professionals. If you do have any questions for our speakers during the course of this session, please submit them via the chat window on your screen. And if you experience any technical issues while viewing today's webinar, please use the email address on your screen. Also, I do need to emphasize that the content being presented in today's webinar is copyrighted material and it's meant for today's session and individual study purposes only. So if you or your organization would like to use the information presented in today's session or are looking for customized education, please contact us. Our sponsor today, Incognia, is a privacy first innovator in location technology headquartered in Palo Alto with teams in the San Francisco Bay Area, New York and Brazil. Today, 200 million plus devices leverage its location technology. They enable the use of anonymized location data to increase account security, reduce fraud, and deliver private location context-aware services. Incognia's location technology uses network signals and on-device sensors to deliver highly precise location information without capturing any PII. By building an anonymous behavioral pattern unique to each user, Incognia provides location context and creates a private digital identity for account security. Now, back to our security experts. Andre Ferez is the CEO and co-founder of Incognia. He's an expert on location technology and a strong advocate of user privacy. Location uh, technology developed by Andre and his co-founders has been deployed on more than 200 million smartphones. Philippe Sequeira, Global Head of Operations RAPI, is responsible for Fleet Quality in RAPI, a Latin American super app present in nine countries and more than 30, with more than 30 million customers. Philippe is passionate about data-driven decisions that transform business. A big part of his job is paving the way for couriers to be successful in the platform and ensuring security for them as well as their users and partners. So let's jump straight into the questions. Andre, can you tell us a little bit more about location spoofing? How exactly does it work? Absolutely. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here real quick uh, so you can take a look at um, the slides. So yeah, basically uh, location spoofing is, is being used by fraudsters um, in, in many cases simply because they want to hide their true location, right? They, they don't wanna be found. So um, there are uh, new, fraud schemes that are, that are being uh, uh, using location spoofing as, a, as an entry point. And here I'm going to share a little bit more uh, about uh, these, these issues. Uh, and during the conversation, we're gonna talk about some, some real world uh, use cases. So um, to, to bring a few examples here, um, uh, uh, one, one interesting one is, is from the online gaming space, right? So let's imagine a poker game, right? Um, if, if you have a poker table with like five people, for example, and three out of these five are uh, colluding to try to manipulate that game, uh, they can basically um, play it in a way that the other two that are not participating on that scheme uh, will lose their, their money, right? Um, so 
how does location spoofing come into something like this, right? You have a lot of online uh, poker gaming um, applications, for example, right? So um, the, the three players that are trying to manipulate that game, they will be at the same location, right? And they would be using location spoofing techniques to show to the application that they are actually in different places. Otherwise, they would be blocked, right? So that's that's an example of, of uh, location spoofing being applied to uh, fraudulent activity, in this case, in the online gaming uh, space, right? But this applies to, to other things as well. Another topic uh, that, that we're going to talk about here more specifically is delivery services, right? And also ride hailing. So applications that rely on uh, location for logistical purposes. And what happens here is that, for example, on the driver side, uh, there are incentives for these drivers that uh, make like longer rides, for example. So a rider would use location spoofing uh, to show to the system that they, they, they've made a very long ride. Uh, so they would make more money, but they actually didn't even leave the place they were, right? So that's another uh, possibility here, or even uh, some, some of these drivers could use location spoofing uh, to, to sh show that they are at a certain location in which uh, prices uh, tend to be higher, for example, near airports, right? Um, they would accept the rides. They would never show up. But if they um, accept the ride and, and the user doesn't uh, arrive to their car, uh, they would still make some money, right? So, so they, they could be like just sitting at home using location spoofing to accept a number of rides. Uh, they would never um, take anyone anywhere, uh, but they would still be making money, right? So that's, that's another uh, issue. And then the, the other thing is, is around uh, fraud farms, right? So uh, basically, um, when there is systematic type of fraud, right? So a more organized type of fraudulent activity, um, we see that many of these fraudsters are using location spoofing techniques uh, to make it harder to be found, right? So the, the authorities, they usually get access to, to data from uh, e-commerce companies and banking uh, institutions. Uh, and once they analyze the data, they see the location information, they're not able to correlate that to a single place in which that fraudulent activity is, is happening from. Um, so in this case, by detecting location spoofing, we're able to identify the true location uh, in which the fraudulent activity is happening. And then we can block that um, in, in a way that makes, makes the life of the, the fraudster uh, harder. And finally, the, the last category here would be uh, social and, and dating platforms. Um, and location spoofing is being used usually to uh, enable these people to create fake accounts and to access uh, content from, from uh, specific regions, for example. So um, one, of, one of our customers is a, is a social media company, right? And, and they have been uh, struggling with this issue around uh, misinformation and fake news um, and, and hate speech, et cetera. Uh, and one of the ways they found uh, to attack this problem was by leveraging location signals to identify uh, that multiple accounts were being accessed and created uh, from the same location, right? So um, it, it was not uh, a coincidence uh, that so many phones and so many accounts were related to the same place. So in that way, they, they can relate all of those accounts and, and by linking all of those accounts, they're able to detect these bad actors, take down their accounts and block them from creating uh, new accounts in the future, right? Same applies to dating. Uh, we've seen some, even some, some documentaries uh, on, on Netflix talking about uh, Tinder and the types of scams that were going on on platforms like that. Uh, so the same concept here could be applied, right? Once you identify the bad actor, you leverage location, location signals to block that particular uh, place so that that person is not able to access the service anymore, even if they buy new phones and, and, and do things like that. So uh, getting into more, uh, a little bit more technical here, um, there are basically five ways in which fraudsters are spoofing their location, in which they're hiding their true location. Uh, the first one is related to uh, IP-based geolocation. So with the IP address of a user, you're able to locate them uh, usually down to the city level. So it's not super precise. You can identify in which city that person is, but you're not able to identify, for example, in which street or in which building that device is located. Um, but, but still, processors are able to 
um, spoof that type of information, right? So for example, um, if, a, if a fraudster from a different country, let's say uh, North Korea or Russia is trying to attack a financial institution in the US, right? They could use a proxy or a VPN to show an IP from the US. So the banking institution would not flag that as suspicious, uh, but they're actually somewhere else, right? And, and, and they're committing this fraud from a, a different location, a different country, a different jurisdiction, right? So that's the, the first part here, which is the most basic type of location spoofing. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about mobile applications, uh, then these applications are able to get a lot more accurate information about location because they have access not only to the IP addresses, but also to the GPS information, right? So the operating systems, both Android and iOS, they enable developers to access data from the GPS. But there is an issue there, which is um, for uh, these developers, uh, the, the, the two platforms, they have decided to uh, build a few feature that enables developers to test their applications as if they were in different location. Why was this created, right? Because there are many global apps that have different functionalities depending on the country. So for example, if we, we look at uh, a ride hailing company like Uber or Lyft, right? Um, they have different policies for different countries. So in, in the US, for example, you can only pay with your uh, credit card, but in countries like Brazil, you can pay with cash, right? So you have to have different versions of the, the same application um, running for different locations. So if I'm a developer, right, working on that uh, application and, and I'm currently here located in, in California, but I'm developing a feature for the Brazilian version of Uber, I need to have a way to test that feature that I just developed, right? And that's uh, what, what was built by the operating system so that the developer can test their applications as if they were in different locations. So that's a feature, but unfortunately that feature is being exploited by bad actors uh, to spoof their location information, right? So the most popular form of, of location spoofing when it comes to GPS is the use of GPS spoofing apps, right? So uh, anyone could go to the app store or Google play store. Uh, if you search for, uh, fake GPS or GPS spoofing, for example, you're going to find a number of applications that enable you to spoof that information. So it's a, it's a very accessible type of tool that anyone can use. You don't have to be like a, a hacker on a basement with a hoodie. Uh, anyone can do it. Uh, so it's super accessible for fraudsters. That's why it's so popular. Um, uh, uh, a side note here is that one of the apps that uh, popularized the use of location spoofing applications was actually the, the gaming app uh, from Pokemon called Pokemon Go. Uh, and the reason why I popularized uh, this type of, of application was that um, in certain locations, you could find um, specific type of Pokemons that were more valuable, like Central Park in New York, for example. So people from all over the world would spoof their location to show that they were at the Central Park um, and, and they would be able to capture uh, those Pokemon. So actually that was the moment in which uh, location spoofing became popular and everybody started downloading. And then the fraudsters identified an opportunity uh, with that and, and started using it for malicious purposes. So GPS spoofing is the, the, the most popular form of, of, of spoofing for GPS data, but you also have emulators, instrumentation tools, and app tampering as other alternatives for, for fraudsters to, to spoof this type of information. So finally, just a, a few more data points here, talking uh, more about delivery apps. Um, on, on Incognizant Network, we have identified um, a, a number of users spoofing location information. So on average, we see about uh, 1.9 million uh, location events that are being spoofed. And uh, we, we have identified that on, on the same uh, month, about 13,000 uh, devices were generating location data uh, with with spoofed information, right? So there, there is volume there. Uh, so basically we're talking about potentially 13,000 um, fraudsters or hackers uh, that are finding ways to uh, commit fraud in these delivery applications. So this is a single uh, industry uh, in, in, in a specific region and we are able already to see 
uh, high volumes, right? Um, and then finally, just a quick explanation on how Incogni is able to detect location spoofing and identify the true location of the user. Uh, the main thing we do is we create what we call location fingerprints, right? So instead of relying on the OS level uh, location information, uh, we capture data from other sensors like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, even a GPS, and we combine all of those things, creating the equivalent of a fingerprint for each location, right? So for example, in this place, uh, there is a unique set of Wi-Fi signals and, and Bluetooth signals that don't exist anywhere else, right? So we create a fingerprint based on that. And if we identify a mismatch between the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth data and the GPS signal, we, we know that there is GPS spoofing going on, for example, right? Other things we do are the device integrity checks, um, we, which are basically analyzing if there are uh, misconfigurations on that device or if there are uh, apps that are used for this type of malicious purposes. If we identify this type of misconfiguration or uh, suspicious apps, we would flag that device as uh, suspicious as well. Uh, so we would potentially block it or, or we would not uh, use the data that, that is coming from that device. Uh, and then, then finally, uh, we, we have the concept of that, that we call watch list, uh, which are basically devices, locations, networks that we flag as suspicious once we identify that there was fraudulent activity related to it, right? So if the fraudster comes back to us, um, we, we would re-identify them, even if they're using different devices, uh, because the, the location will be the same, and we would identify that location as, as a fraud farm. Uh, which is um, very, very prevalent uh, because most of the fraudsters, they are professionals. They do that for a living. So they do that recurrently. Uh, and once we identify the place in which they operate, uh, we force them to move out. So we make the operation more expensive, more complex, and they usually go away to try to defraud other institutions. So that's, mm -hmm. that's all I had for today. Happy to dive into the, the questions. Thank you. Certainly. And, and that's really fascinating because I, I must admit there were some applications that I hadn't thought of. And uh, and of course, as more applications use location, uh, you're going to have even more uh, use cases. In fact, I just thought of one, which is uh, here in Europe, we have uh, pay TV, which you can uh, premium pay TV. You can often get free to air from another territory if you spoof your location. So, yeah. Uh, Andrew, can you can you also tell us a little bit more about how uh, what what you found from your new insights report on location spoofing fraud? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the, the the first thing is 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 that there is a lot of volume. Um, like it's 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 incredible. Like how many people are are leveraging these techniques um, for for different purposes, right? So uh, some of them are using it to access. Uh, content that they, they shouldn't have access to uh, with the example you, you just gave, right? So in the entertainment and media industry, that's that's a big problem. Um, uh, in, in industries like food delivery, for example, uh, <clears throat> there are these uh, abuses related to incentives. So I think Felipe can, can talk a little bit more about that, for example. Um, and, 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 and yeah, and overall, um, like every, every fraudster is, is trying to hide their, their true location. So so that's why the volumes are, are so high, right? They, they don't wanna be found. Um, so if you identify location spoofing, um, you are a few steps away from actually catching that fraudster. Um, and and, and that's, that's the most important piece because um, once we identify the bad actor, uh, we need to make sure that we're able to block them over time so they don't come back um, because, because that's the issue, right? There, there's always going to be fraud you'll never be able to bring fraud to zero. But if we're able to block repeat fraud, uh, repeat bad actors, uh, you, you're you able to uh, have a much safer environment for, for your customers. Okay. And, and Philippe, uh, um, Andre sort of suggested there that, you know, you, uh, Rappi has had a challenge with uh, location spoofing. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, of course. Um, uh, so, as you mentioned during my presentation, um, Happy has millions of, of users, right? So I guess it's easy to understand that identity check as a whole is a big thing for us. And, and location spoofing is a big part of it. And um, basically we have users faking their location in the platform, just like Andreas said, for their own benefits. 
So one of our challenges being one step ahead of those users, mapping the latest identity falsification trends. And, and that's where Incognito comes in. And not only they are helping us uh, keep the pace of, of new trends, of new spoofing trends, right? But, but most importantly, through their services, we are being able to better identify fraudulent access. And, and in terms of, of examples, uh, we have a big range of scenarios, right? From, from simple fake GPS, um, to elaborate device uh, fingerprint hacking. And, and, and Andrea mentioned the, the Pokemon Go uh, example. And, and as a matter of, matter of fact, we have actually learned from, from their experience. And then we actually have done some, some changes based on, on, on lessons learned from Pokemon Go, which is, um, which is uh, uh, as Andrea mentioned, I guess it was when it be became popular. And, um, and, and one of the most uh, simple examples um, that we have is, is users checking in on a certain location um, when they are not actually there. They do it so they can, for instance, close an order and move to the next one as fast as possible. In, in a more elaborate example on top of that previous one, it's when they do it with multiple accounts being accessed in the same device so they can optimize even more their performance on, on their platform, right? And, and an even more elaborate one, it's when they do it by hacking the device uh, fingerprint features that we currently have, uh, so it gets even harder to track. Mm -hmm. And in an and interest variation of, of this, um, this sort of fraud uh, is uh, when you know, careers, partners, and, and users, they collude create, creating, uh, let's say, a fake order to speed up their earnings. And, and, and if, if they can spoof their location, uh, they're able to do it faster and close more orders in a shorter uh, a period of time. And, and another different kind of example, um, which is actually where Incognis is helping us uh, more, it's, it's users that lend their accounts to other people, which impacts very negatively uh, on the safety of the whole environment. Uh, they, they basically emulate their location uh, on, you know, on their default locations, let's say like that, when, when they normally log in. And, and, and they do it to avoid, you know, the security checks features that we have. And then it's easier to just, you know, lend account to, to someone else. Mm. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can see how you could be using that for basically spoofing your, your behavioral analytics. Um, Andrew, what, what sort of other examples have you got regarding the impact of location spoofing in other industries um, for companies and trusted users? Perfect. Yeah, so when, when we talk about fraud, um, like all of these different schemes um, could, be, could be reduced uh, to two main issues, right? Which are one, the ability to create fake accounts or multiple accounts, and two, the ability to access multiple accounts, right? Um, so so in, in pretty much every industry, when it comes to like digital commerce and digital uh, banking, et cetera, uh, has to deal with this type of, of problem. And location spoofing comes in because it makes it more scalable, right? Uh, so for example, um, if I'm trying to, to create uh, multiple accounts on a banking platform, uh, because the, the purpose here is to, to launder money, right? With, with these fake accounts, what would I do? Uh, well, I would, I would have access to multiple um, IDs some of these could be fake IDs. Some of these could be stolen IDs. There were multiple data breaches recently, right? So this data is out there for sale. Um, and when I start the application process on a bank to, to create my account, one of the data points um, that, that this bank wants to, to check is one, is this person uh, located um, at this country, right? Uh, that's, that's the most basic thing they, they want to verify. Like if, if someone is trying to open a bank account in a, in a uh, bank that is based in the US, this person should be here, right? Um, so uh, the fraudster could be anywhere else in the world. And if they're using location spoofing, the bank would recognize them as if they were in the US. So they would probably have an easier um, uh, uh, process for, for opening their account, right? So, so that's one of the ways in which a fraudster could leverage location spoofing to open multiple accounts, right? They, they could be in different locations, they could be doing that. Um, some banks are a little bit more sophisticated. So uh, they check not only if you are in that country, 
but they would actually validate your address information. So for example, when you scan your driver's license, your home address is right there, right? So some banks, what they do is they, they try to match that to the GPS location of that phone uh, to see if you are actually near uh, or at that address, right? Um, if the fraudster is using GPS spoofing tools, uh, they could spoof the location information to show as if they were at that address. So the bank would allow them to open that account, right? Um, so making sure that the location data that you're analyzing is trustworthy, it's it's legitimate, it's really important. So you're able to identify uh, these, these accounts and tell the difference between a legitimate account and fraudulent activity, right? So that's for account opening. That applies to banking, but it applies in the same way to food delivery, right? So when you're onboarding uh, uh, a driver or a courier uh, to your platform, you want to make sure that you can trust that person. Uh, you want to ask for some information so you can validate them. Uh, so for example, one uh, good thing would be to understand like where, uh, what's this, this user's phone number, their name, um, but also their address, right? That's another way to uh, verify that. If you don't have protections for location spoofing, they could open fake accounts. So that's the first piece, creating fake accounts. The second part is uh, related to accessing multiple accounts, right? So there is a lot of social engineering going out there. Uh, there are many fraudsters that are being able to convince end users to share their credentials like passwords and one-time passcodes, for example. Uh, and once they have access to that data, they're able to take over your account. And again, this applies to uh, banking, food delivery, online commerce, gaming, every digital uh, application uh, that that stores some kind of value, uh, it's is a target for for this. Because for example, the courier apps, uh, these people have actually a, like a, a, a balance there that they can transfer to a bank account. So if I take over an account of a courier, uh, I could change the, the 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 banking information and I could withdraw the money that's on that balance to my account instead of the the account of the the owner um, of of that uh, app. So. So for, for uh, fraudsters accessing multiple accounts, you can use location to identify what we call device farms, right? Or, or fraud farms. Um, but if you don't have protections for location spoofing, uh, it's, it's not going to, to work, right? So um, you have to be able to identify the true location. So you see, okay, from this single house, for example, or from this single uh, location, uh, we're seeing uh, 10, 20, 30, 50 logins a day, right? That's not normal activity. Uh, we, we, we should be expecting uh, much, much less. Um, so if we identify this very high activity in terms of, of accounts being accessed, and it could be from a single device, it could be from hundreds of, of devices, um, but, but the location would be the same, you would be able to block that, right? So having access to uh, spoofing resistant location information would enable you to stop these bad actors uh, from, from doing this. So essentially, uh, that's that's a proxy for identifying good and bad behavior uh, so that you can stop uh, the, the creation of multiple fake accounts of systematic account opening. And in the same way, you can stop uh, the, the, the fraudsters from accessing accounts that they they don't own. So, yeah, as, as well as, um, you know, enterprises, uh, banks, sounds like a great tool for law enforcement, might even provide evidence for their, uh, uh, you know, uh, of crimes. So how exactly does uh, Incognia detect fraudsters spoofing location? Perfect. So um, the, the, the first part is, is, as it said, like the, the device integrity check. So we want to make sure that we can trust that device. Right? So, for example, if we detect that that's not a real device. It's actually an emulator, right? Um, that's something we, we would catch. That's something we would block. Um, if that device has uh, some misconfiguration or, or some uh, uh, like privileged access, uh, for example, like root, uh, in that way, we would identify that uh, that device is risky, uh, not necessarily is a bad actor, right? But uh, there is a higher risk that that person could spoof location. Um, and, and then 
Uh, besides that, besides analyzing the the device's configuration, uh, the other things we do is is to analyze the applications that are present on that device, right? So if we identify that there is a GPS spoofing application there, uh, that's a very strong indicator that that person could be uh, spoofing location, right? Same applies to identifying uh, app tampering tools. So there are, there are applications that enable you uh, to create multiple instances of the same app, right? You can clone the app. So uh, you, you can access multiple accounts at the same time um, from that same device, right? So identifying these app tampering tools and also instrumentation tools uh, is, is very critical um, because these applications, they, they give a lot of power to the user uh, so they can tamper with the, the source code of the application. And once, once you're able to do that, you, you, can, you can do pretty much everything, right? So being able to detect these um, suspicious patterns uh, is the first layer of defense. Uh, the second layer is, is mostly around analyzing network information, right? So we, we wanna identify if the user is logging in from an IP address that was flagged as suspicious in the past. If we see that again, we would probably block that user or at least flag them as suspicious. Um, we also wanna analyze the, the uh, Wi-Fi information. So if that user is connected to a Wi-Fi router that was used by fraudsters in the past, that's probably a fraud farm, right? And, and then finally, we also use the, the, the Wi-Fi scanning and Bluetooth scanning to fingerprint the location and to identify the true location of that device. So when we compare that location information to the GPS data, uh, if there is a mismatch, we identify that there is location spoofing going on. So it's a mix. It's a mix of analyzing network information, analyzing sensor data, analyzing uh, the configuration of, of the device and even the applications that are installed on that device. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a cat and mouse game. Like fraudsters are always changing their techniques. So you have to evolve, you have to be ahead uh, because they move quickly. So Philippe, did you want to answer that? Yeah, sorry, sorry to jump in. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask you about this cat and mouse situation. So one of the cool things that Incognito is doing for us is that you're helping us, you know, to keep keep pace of, uh, of the trends. And how do you do so? How do you how do you make sure you are on, you know, um, one, one step ahead of everyone of the process? Perfect. Um, yeah, that's that's super challenging. Like um, it, it requires a lot of research. Um, another thing that helps a, a, a lot is that we we are working in many different industries. So we have customers in the banking space, we have social media companies, we have gaming companies, we have food delivery, e-commerce. So what's interesting is that we, and, and we also act in, in different geographies, right? So we have operations in the US, in Latin America, Europe, Southeast Asia. Uh, so what's interesting is that we are watching different things in different locations and in different industries, right? So usually, uh, we see the, the transition. So uh, as an example, um, about two years ago, uh, we started seeing a trend in, in Latin America of um, uh, fraudsters using bots on social media to social engineer users uh, to give away their credentials, right? So the way it happened was um, if you followed uh, the social media page of a bank, for example, a bot would follow you back and their, their name would be very similar to the bank. There, there would probably be a, a, a like a, a, a typo or something like that. So the user wouldn't even, even notice. Uh, the logo was the same. So the user would think that that was the bank uh, starting the interaction, right? And the, the initial conversations like seemed uh, legit, right? The, the, the bot would ask you for feedback. How is it going? Um, how do you like our application? Please provide feedback. Please rate us on the app store. So the user wouldn't find that suspicious, right? But at some point, the bot would send you uh, a, a transaction information asking if you made that transaction because they flagged it as suspicious. So that immediately puts the user in a state of mind of vulnerability because they would be concerned like someone is trying to steal me, right? Uh, and then the bot would start asking questions. Okay, if this wasn't you, uh, this, this was probably fraud. We need to check your account. Uh, we, we, we will need to um, log into your account to, to 
analyze more information. So I need you to share some information with us. And then the bot starts asking for information that eventually will give the fraudster the ability to take over that user's account, right? Uh, so it's a pretty sophisticated type of attack. It started in, in last America two years ago. And recently we started seeing this same type of attack happening in the US with, with uh, fraudsters trying to take over uh, the, the user's account so they could send money using Zelle, which is an instant payments platform that is present in the US, right? So, so we saw that transition. And now that we're being asked by, by US banks uh, for, for this, we already know how to solve that problem, right? Um, the opposite uh, has, has happened recently in which we, we saw um, certain uh, uh, activity from fraudsters uh, spoofing location in for, like US institutions uh, in which they were using that to uh, validate their uh, address information while applying for a bank account, right? Um, and then we started seeing that uh, happening in, in emerging markets uh, a couple months later, right? So um, by being present in so many different industries and so many different uh, geographies enable us to uh, identify these issues earlier and then apply the learnings to, uh, to, to all of our uh, customers. Uh, so I understand that that you're foreseeing some trends coming from one place to another, right? And and when you see when Incognito see new new stuff coming in, new fraud, new fraud types coming in, how do you uh, work on that? I mean, how do you approach uh, your customers? How do you approach your your teams? You know, to to tackle it. Perfect. Yeah, so that that happens in two ways. The first one is um, we are we're very close to our customers. Uh, one thing we we decided to do was was to focus on very large accounts. So basically, companies that handle uh, millions of customers, um, because because then we can have a closer relationship with them. So so basically, with with every customer, we have recurring um, meetings to understand how the product is performing, uh, if there are new types of fraudulent activity. Uh, happening, and once we learn something new and we we implement that uh, to our platform, then we update the product for all of our customers, right? So we go back to them and say, okay, here's an update. Uh, you you need to to update the integration for this version if you want to protect your application from this type of attack. This is how it works, etc. Um, so so there is a lot of collaboration between uh, uh, our uh, our teams and our customers. Um, that enable us to to learn more quickly and apply these learnings to to everyone. So uh, scale is is super important here. Like being able to be present in multiple industries, multiple geographies, uh, is really what enables us to to move quickly in in regards to that. Um, and in this close relationship that that we develop with customers is is key. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for your reply, Andre. Well, that's good. I, I've just got a quick question on, on a totally different area. I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, preventing spoofing um, to uh, protect the end users and to protect the organizations. But what about when you've got a legitimate end user who is a subject of investigation and it turns out that they are legitimate, but their they're given location uh, is PII. So does incognia know where the users are are, are you invading their privacy perfect that's it that's a very important question so um incognia even even the, the name of the company stands for um anonymity right so it, it comes from the latin word incognito uh which means like a, a person in disguise um so basically what we're, we're what we're building here is a digital identity that is a proxy for you to access online services while protecting uh, your your personal um, information, your, your your real world identity, let's say. So what we do is we're able to build this digital identity based on device information, right? So that includes uh, all all of the uh, device fingerprinting techniques that we apply, but also the the location fingerprinting techniques that that we use. But we don't need to really know who's that person. So we don't have access to their name. We don't have access to their email address, their phone number anything that can help someone reach out to that person in the real world, let's say, is not ingested by our platform. 
Uh, and even the location data itself is anonymized because what we really need is to analyze the location data relative to the user's legitimate behavior, right? So we're like, we, we don't even need to know where you are in the world. What we need to know is if you are at a location that you go frequently, and if you are at a location that you go frequently, uh, the likelihood that this is you is very high. And by identifying that, we're able to let these users exper experience a frictionless authentication process, right? So they don't need to type passwords. They don't need to scan their faces. They don't need to uh, go through many hoops uh, to, to verify their identity. Um, but if we identify a mismatch um, or that the user is at a location that was used by a fraudster in the past, for example, we would flag them as suspicious and we would challenge them to prove their real identity. If it's a good user, they're going to pass that challenge. If it's a bad actor, they will be blocked, right? Um, so being able to do that without really knowing who is that person is critical to us because um, matching personal data that can identify you with location information could be dangerous, right? So that's why we have this clear separation uh, between uh, like device related information and personal data. The personal data doesn't come into our servers. We only analyze the device related uh, information. A point that I have here, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's what you just um, answered about, you know, the, the friction, it's a, it's a bit different from, from, from what um, Tony asked. So a big thing about fraud is uh, ensuring that we use, you know, our, our features or fraudulent features, um, generating the, the least feature, uh, friction possible to the legitimate users, let's say like that. And, and this is one of the things that, that again, Incognito is helping us, and I know it's helping the market as well. It's having more uh, valid information before, you know, taking the decision to actually uh, generating a very big friction, you know, like a, a selfie, a liveness and stuff like that. We can read incognia uh, information before doing so. And then we have, we can, you know, have a more seamless, more smooth experience uh, for our customers and users. Yes. Yes. The sure. topic of friction, just following up on, on that, uh, it, it is very critical because what happens today is that uh, the the standard behavior from these applications is to to challenge everybody, right? So even if you're logging into your uh, account from the same device that you always use, from the same location that you're uh, usually at when you when you use that service, they will always ask you for the password, right? And sometimes you forget that password. Uh, sometimes uh, you you. You don't have access to to your your uh, wallets where you store this type of information, for example, uh, and that could lead to uh, that friction could lead to basically the user saying, "Well, I'm not doing this now. I'm doing like sometime in the future," and and they end up not buying uh, your service. Uh, they end up not using your your um, your service. So so that's bad for for the business, right? So friction usually um, makes. Uh, users go away, um, and especially now when uh, we start seeing more and more applications implementing passwordless authentication, offering a better user experience, um, we're, we're starting to see users transitioning, right? So they want to move away from more bureaucratic institutions that, that ask a lot of questions to institutions that offer a more frictionless experience um, and, and, and being able to um, ensure that you can trust that user by analyzing those signals uh, is is critical because you also don't want to uh, bring security uh, down, right? You want to maintain security or even improve it uh, while you enhance the user experience. Okay, now we're pretty much ready to wrap up, but uh, I don't know, Andre, if you want to uh, just give us any key takeaway that you want the audience to get out of today's webinar. Perfect. Um, well, I, I would say that the key takeaway here is that um, especially if, if your uh, company or service is present on, on mobile applications. Uh, location is, is a, a signal uh, that can help you do a lot, that can help you um, deliver a frictionless experience, that can help you enhance security, prevent fraud, um, but only if you make sure that you are uh, um, 
protect it from location spoofing because the fraudsters already know how to do it. It's really accessible. Uh, so if you want to leverage location signals for security purposes, um, you need to make sure that you have strong location spoofing detection capabilities. Uh, otherwise, instead of enhancing your security controls, instead of improving the user experience, you could be actually opening a security vulnerability on your application. So uh, it's important to be aware of that uh, because it's a very strong and valuable signal, uh, but it, it has to be carefully implemented so it doesn't create more problems than uh, than than you have today. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Andre Faraz and Philippe Sakura for sharing your insights and expertise today. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, Incognia. Uh, I also want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to attend this session. And I do trust today's discussion has provided some useful data points to enable your organization to understand who is faking location, how are fraudsters using location spoofing to attack location-based apps. We hope to see you again at one of our upcoming events. For Information Security Media Group, I'm Tony Morgan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.